Look, I want to start with uh, the strategy that the Morrison government has chosen to deal with coronavirus. Of course, every country around the world has got a, a different way that they've chosen to tackle this. Uh, Scott Morrison has has, seems to have chosen a, a partial shutdown over an extended six-month period where he wants to keep the economy slowly ticking over by not going into a full lockdown in order to both uh, save as many jobs as possible and also... Um, slow the impact on our health system to stop the hospitals from being overwhelmed. Mark, starting with you, do, do you think this is the right strategy? No, I think it's the wrong strategy. I, I think prolonging the torture for Australian businesses through to October is a slow death of the Australian economy. And uh, I think the overseas experience, when you look at island states like Taiwan, Japan and effectively South Korea with their hard border, um, a, a fast, hard uh, lockdown for six to seven weeks, uh, reopen and then reboot your economies, I think is better for the long-term health of the Australian economy than thinking that these businesses can survive through to October. I, I, I did a survey where I live in South West Sydney, over 140 businesses in the main street of Camden, I think a fairly typical place, and nearly half of them, nearly half of them are closed already. And I can guarantee you, Shari, by October they'll all be gone. They'll all be closed. Isn't, so I just think this is the wrong strategy. Isn't the worry, though, Mark, that if we have a faster lockdown, that there could be a second wave of this? A, a harder lockdown, sorry, that there could be a second wave of this? Well, the international evidence shows that island states seem to have an advantage. Uh, I mentioned ta Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong. You can look at South Korea. Australia as an island has the natural geographic advantage of having closed borders if we choose to close them. Now, obviously, the Ruby Princess and some of the things that happened at Sydney Airport weren't a very good example of closure. But we could close our borders to people, uh, trade domestically, once the economy was reopened after a um, relatively short, hard lockdown, and also try and trade globally and reboot the Australian economy. I, I think it's very hard to find a business person, especially small business sector, who would think they can survive these current conditions through to October. I just think the Prime Minister's got the worst of both worlds. He's got a large part of the economy closed down and other businesses are saying they won't survive. He's got some activities underway that potentially spread the virus. And um, I just think this is foolhardy. I don't think he's been on top of this. And I, I think the other problem with the Prime Minister is that because he copped such a hammering over the bushfire crisis and all his problems there, he's overmanaged this. Too many announcements, too many, uh, too much verbiage in the media. Uh, there's one pre press conference there. He was closing something down. He didn't even know what it was. So I don't think this has built confidence uh, in the business sector or in the broader community either. Sarah, what's your view on this? Uh, would a, a shorter, harder lockdown uh, be better than, than a longer extended partial one? Well, about a week or so ago, the Greens had called for a similar type of uh, lockdown and shutdown as we've seen in New Zealand um, because we um, believe that in those, these types of situations you need to go hard and go early. Um, since then, of course, we've seen some more restrictions put in place by uh, the federal government and the national cabinet, and things seem to have been uh, kind of taken on board. We we can see the um, curve, what they, um, or the data that's coming out at the moment, um, starting to look as like it could be uh, flattening. But I think the real concern now is um, we still don't know the impact of community uh, person to person transmission and the impact that that is going to have. So. Um, you know, I, I look, I agree with Mark in the sense that, um, you know, big problem we've had here is uh, the Ruby Princess and uh, the cruise liners coming in. I mean, here in South Australia, over a quarter of the cases uh, of coronavirus we have came from the Ruby Princess alone, a, over a quarter of them. I mean, that is just significant. Um, so that has been a fiasco, and I'm sure we can um, talk a bit more about that, Shari. But... Um, now that we've kind of uh, have those restrictions on people coming into the country, the quarantine period for 14 days, uh, what we now have to be managing is uh, that community tr uh, transmission and what that really means. Um, we're yet to see. Yeah, we're yet to see it properly because there's just not enough testing has been done. You know, the focus mm. of the testing is still people who have returned from overseas and you've got fewer people coming from overseas or people who've been in contact with a confirmed case. Um, but, Mark, you know, it, it, in terms of the exit strategy for all this, I think that's one thing that has been missing um, that we haven't heard from any of the leaders. How, does, how do we eventually get out of this, even if it is October, September? You know, how does this end? 
Well, uh, they compare this to going to war. Um, military strategists always say when you go to war, you need an exit strategy in mind. It can't be indefinite. And at the moment, at the moment, um, we, we think, that, you know, I've, I've said I think this is a big mistake. The exit strategy is October. And you've got to bring that forward. It shouldn't be any later than, than June. In terms of community transmission, I, I know it's an intrusion of privacy and it's deeply regrettable, but there's good news today that it appears that some of the telecommunications data is being used by the health authorities. Because if you know of an outbreak in a certain location or a certain event, there was a wedding, for example, on the south coast of, um, of Sydney near Wollongong, uh, and you have the mobile phone data of who was present, you can track them, test them, and lock them down if necessary to contain that um, contagion in the community. So uh, this is something that's worked very successfully in South Korea. I, I know it's a dreadful thing in terms of personal privacy and the intrusion involved, but if we are at war, you need to use every single available mechanism. And if we can stop community transmission by telecommunications data being in the hands of health authorities, I think it's something we've just got to put up with for the foreseeable months ahead. So I think the exit strategy should be to lock down as hard as possible uh, do, use the, any mechanism available to deal with community transmission and try and get this economy open in, in June because the big fear is that businesses are just having a slow, torturous death and there won't be anything left come October. Yeah. Sarah, I mean, hasn't the world turned upside down when you have people, not, not just Mark but others as well, you know, calling for our phones to be tracked uh, and, you know, we've seen it at least in Sydney, um, we, we seem to be turning into a police state where people are getting in trouble for just sitting by themselves in a park bench. Do you mm -hmm. think these, all these measures are justified? Look, I know that there's been um, quite some concern about some of the measures that have been put in place and I think um, uh, if people are starting to use telecommunication data to work out who is where at what point in order to track them down, I'm sure there's going to be more concern. Um, that's why we need proper um, parliamentary oversight of these types of tactics and strategies employed as well. Um, it's all very well and good. We need to go in hard and we need to go in fast. We need to try and stop the spread of this virus. And we've all, we're all in this together. We've all got to share the pain and we've all got to do our job to, to help um, take responsibility. Um, but the parliament uh, needs to have um, ultimate responsibility in keeping the government uh, and their government agencies to account. And it's one of the reasons why I'm concerned about uh, Scott Morrison's approach here. Uh, not only does he um, want the economy to shut down, as Mark says, until October, he also doesn't want the parliament um, up and running until closer to that point as well. And I think um, if we're going to be taking these steps to intrude on people's lives, to use technology in ways that we've never used before, to him. Uh, to uh, increase the powers uh, that the police force have, for example, um, we need to make sure uh, that the community knows what's going on and who is responsible and who's going to be held accountable, which is why on Wednesday, when um, Parliament goes back, it will be a very small Parliament. Uh, only a, a number of people from each of the parties are going, um, and they're going to be debating uh, a number of things. But one of the key things we will be pushing for, along with the other crossbenchers, and um, I'm not sure, Mark, whether you can clarify this, but I understand that One Nation is of the same view, uh, that uh, we need a, a, a joint committee to ensure there is proper oversight of this as we go on, because the last thing we should be doing is saying, well, here you go, government, here's all the money, here's the keys to uh, everything, uh, knock yourselves out. Mark, are you pushing for that? Well, uh, in the New South Wales Parliament, when the government basically... Uh, wanted us to legislate for blank check powers. Uh, we compared it to martial law powers of like colonial governors. Um, it, it was passed through with the support of the Greens, Labor, uh, Liberal and the National Party. One Nation voted against it. Uh, and I believe that those extreme powers, uh, while to some extent necessary, also require parliamentary supervision. We would have been better off with a joint parliamentary committee, both houses, all parties represented, meeting online to supervise and, 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 and give proper accountability to how these powers are being used. I've got a lot of sympathy for the police. You know, they go to the police academy. There's no course there on uh, policing social distancing in a pandemic. So they're in unique circumstances. But I think the real problem is that these parliaments have handed over extreme martial law powers to executive government without any parliamentary supervision. And I would urge upon the Berejiklian government, or say the Morrison government in, in, in Sarah Hanson-Young's parliament, to have a joint parliamentary committee meeting online
to have a look at these things. And if regulations go too far, and there have been some instances of that, then parliamentarians need to knock them into shape. Yeah. Look, Sarah, I just had the New South Wales Health Minister Brad Hazard on at the start of my show, and he made uh, quite an extraordinary, I think, defence of his health officials, and he refused to accept um, that they did anything wrong even now. He, he said it, it, they, it wasn't wrong to let those passengers off the ship. What do you make of that? Well, I think that that is just ludicrous. I mean, it is clearly a fiasco that has occurred. Uh, as I said before, uh, a quarter of the cases here in South Australia, all the way over uh, to, to Adelaide, have come because of uh, the stuff-up uh, and very dangerous, deadly stuff-up uh, in New South Wales. Now, there's a lot of blame gaming going on. You know, the federal government's blaming New South Wales government. New South Wales government um, is uh, blaming other people. Everyone's talking about the fact that the cruise ship is, uh, you know, stuffed up here. Um, it is an absolute debacle. It is costing people's lives and um, someone has to take responsibility for it. Again, this is why we should have a proper parliamentary uh, committee to review this type of um, uh, action and to, to hold people accountable. Um, but I also must say, Shari, I mean, we have a federal minister who's responsible for the borders, uh, Peter Dutton. Well, where the hell is he? His MIA has taken no responsibility for this. And I can tell you, I, you know, if, there were, if this was another type of boat, if these, if these boats had other types of people on them, um, of course, uh, we know uh, that Mr Dutton would be out there every single day. And this is one boat that I would have liked Peter Dutton to have stopped and he failed. Well, Mark, it was New South Wales health officials who allowed uh, his passengers off the boat, um, not Peter Dutton, although, of course, Border Force had a role. Uh, do you think uh, the calls for Brad Hazard or the Premier to resign over this are justified? Well, I think it's pretty clear, Shari, that in normal circumstances, the health minister would have been forced to resign by now. He's, he's ultimately responsible for what is the worst public health disaster in the recent history, anyone's memory. Uh, of what's going on in New South Wales. So uh, under normal ministerial responsibility, he'd, uh, he'd be walking the, the plank. Uh, but we're in an emergency, so they're hanging on with this guy. Uh, around Macquarie Street, it said that he's, he's planning to go anyway. I, you know, it's, it's always the luck of the draw, but we would have been so much better off with a Barillaro or a Constance in the health portfolio in this uh, emergency say, situation. Well just on Constance, I have to say he, he is, of course, the Ports Minister and uh, he has, was missing in action. Um, uh, well, I don't know about that. Well. I mean, it's so serious. We're having a criminal investigation now. There will exactly. be undoubtedly a coronial inquiry and, and, and perhaps an independent judicial inquiry with Royal Commission powers is the way to go. But can I just say overall, it's unthinkable for the Minister to get on your program and say that senior health officials have done nothing wrong when ultimately they're responsible uh, for actions that have led to this public health disaster. Now, the last thing we need in the emergency pandemic is for a health minister to defend the indefensible. What's wrong with just saying they got it wrong? Yeah. And he's going to be part of the investigation to make sure it doesn't happen again well, exactly. under any circumstance. So, you know, Brad Hazard is a, is a weak minister defending the indefensible, and goodness gracious, we need to do a lot better than that. Yeah. Look, I just want to um, end this, <laughs> this panel by asking how, how life has changed for both of you. You know, everyone's lives are being affected across the country. Um, millions of families now, of course, are without work, but, but everybody's life is different. You know, there are a lot of parents now homeschooling their children um, while trying to complete their normal daily work duties that they'd normally be in the office for. Uh, Sarah, Mark, you know, what, what, what's, what's the biggest change for you? I think, um, yes, trying to uh, balance all those things, and I know lots of working parents are doing the same. I've had my uh, daughter home being homeschooled and you're trying to do your job and you're trying to be a parent. Um, so I know there's lots of parents out there who um, are wondering how long they can manage all this. Um, my only advice is um, patience um, is a virtue. Uh, be a bit kind to yourself uh, and each other and you know what, you're not always going to get it right every day. I think um, if some days you focus more on work uh, and other days uh, the schoolwork, uh, you know, the kids are having to entertain themselves a bit more, um, don't beat yourself up out of that, over that. Um, we're all in this together and, and we're, we're all, all muddling our way through. Exactly. Mark, we are almost out of time. Very quickly. Oh, well, as you know, Shari, I was a home dad for a long while and, uh, you know, I love that. I Love the kids, love helping with the homework. We live in a pretty good place. I suppose, and obviously we've got economic security, so we're lucky ones. 
But I also like working from the home office. And at this time, the phone doesn't ring as much. You can get a hell of a lot of research and, and, and speech writing done. I'm enjoying that, but I, I, I feel sorry for the people... Uh, obviously, you know, uh, businesses that have gone broke, people who've lost their job and living in tiny apartments, I mean, it must be really tough. I hope government can develop some plans so people can go solo golfing or a bit of fishing, bushwalking, because the more people get outdoors and enjoy a bit of fresh air, right. I think Thank the better you. off they are.